Wait, Mario, no! Don't do it, Mario! End your addiction to random plants and fungi. That flower could be poisonous. Mario, no! No! Mario, no! Wait, he's alive. Or is he? Hello and welcome to the Theories of Jay Greasy. Today we're going to take a look at the science behind perhaps the deadliest weapon in the Mario universe. Yes, this hazardous object drains Mario's 1-up stash faster than both the Boo Mushroom and the Blue Shell. By the way, you should go watch those videos, but not right now though, I need the views. But after the video, you should totally go subscribe to Game Theory, because MatPat is my favorite. Also subscribe to me, I'm good too. Anyways, this deadly weapon is known as the Ice Flower. You might be thinking, why should Bowser be afraid of giving Mario an endless supply of snowballs? But no, we're talking about the Ice Flower from Super Mario Galaxy. Oh yeah, we're taking a look at something so OP that Nintendo only decided to use it once. They didn't even use it in the sequel. I guess they needed the extra space to tell us that Nintendo actually can inflate a Yoshi. Super Mario Galaxy is the game where Nintendo looked at the classic Ice Flower and said, Hey, wait a minute. We already have one of those. Though they changed its ability from Mario throwing blue snowballs to Mario getting to feel like Luigi, but better, and he's cheating. Now it's time for... Life, Life Tips, tips with, with Greasy. greasy. If you're going to walk on water, at least do it the cool way, where it's not frozen already. In this game, the ice flower operates by making Mario so cold that he freezes the water underneath him, creating hexagonal ice plates, which he can stand and skate on. Not sure how this works on lava. I guess he just uses the water in the air. Today we're going to see just how cold Mario would get upon touching this flower. Little disclaimer here, but I will be assuming that all of the energy that comes into Mario just comes through his feet so that Mario's not freezing the air around him, which would trap him in an immovable ice block. Also, I'm assuming that the ice flower doesn't somehow keep Mario warm, or work by pulling cold out of thin air in order to freeze water, or having a 20 second stash of huge ice platforms handy. These three methods are proven false because of the following three evidences. Cold things tend to go to warm things, Mario's new icy skin tone, and, well, Mario could really have anything up his sleeve at this point. We have no way of proving that it's false, so therefore it is. Science! Instead, I'll assume that it works by getting Mario really cold, and he is warmed up by the water beneath him until he returns to a healthy temperature and can no longer freeze water. The first step is finding the volume of each hexagon Mario makes while under his icy influence. We can do this using pixel measurements. Mario is canonically 5 foot 1 or 61 inches tall, and in this picture here, using the Pythagorean theorem, we can see that Mario is also 138.654 pixels tall. Using preview for the Mac, of course. Dividing both by 138.654 means that one pixel is approximately 0.439944 inches. Now we can move on to the hexagons which Mario creates. They are 213 pixels tall and 28 pixels wide. We can convert these to inches by multiplying them by 0.439944, which makes our icy hexagons 93.7072 inches tall and 12.3184 inches wide. Now that the pixel measurements are complete, we can move on to finding the volume of the hexagons. We first need to find the area of the surface which Mario stands on. The easiest way I saw to do this was by splitting it into two trapezoids, finding the area of one, and doubling the result. We have one measurement to help with this, and it's probably the least helpful one we could have. In order to find a side length, which is a lot more helpful, we can isolate the left section from the rest of the hexagon. Now we need to find this angle. There's a formula for finding the angle, but I think explaining why it works would be more helpful here. What we want to do first is find the external angles, and we can do this by extending all six sides. Since this is a regular hexagon, all six external angles are equal. The external angles come together in a full circle, meaning that six angles equal 360 degrees, and one angle equals 60 degrees. Since the external angle and the internal angle are on a line, they add up to 180 degrees, so each of the internal angles are 120 degrees. Going back to our triangle, we can now solve for the other two angles. This is an isosceles triangle, so these two angles are equal. This means that 120 plus 2x equals 180, solve for x and this angle is 30 degrees. Now we can move on to the law of sines. In this case, I'm just going to give you a formula and run, since I don't want to explain it. 
The law of sines says that side length A over the sine of angle A is equal to side length B over the sine of angle B, as demonstrated in the figure to the right. Now we plug in the values. Side A is 93.7072 inches, angle A is 120 degrees, side B is X, and angle B is 30 degrees. After multiplying both sides by the sine of 30 degrees and simplifying, we now know that each side of Mario's icy hexagons are 54.1019 inches long. Now we need to find the area of the two trapezoids inside of the hexagons. To find the area of a trapezoid, you have to take the average of the top and bottom sides and multiply by the height. We already have the top side, so now we need to find the bottom side and the height. From this trapezoid, we can find a rectangle and two more triangles. Since the line splitting off the triangle makes a right angle on this side, and the hole is 120, we can infer that this angle is 30 degrees, and this angle is therefore 60 degrees. A 30-60-90 triangle is special, since it's easy to know what each side length is. If the side length across from the right angle is 1, the side across from the 60 degree angle is root 3 halves, and the third side is 1 half. This means that whatever the side length of the hexagon is, this side will always be half its length. But when we look at the other triangle, the bottom side is also one half of the side length of the hexagon. And since we have a rectangle in the middle, these two sides are equal, and the whole bottom side is twice the top side, or 108.2038 inches. Additionally, the height of the trapezoid is root three halves of the side length, or half of our original measurement, which is 46.8536 inches. Now we can plug those values into our area formula. We will need to multiply this by 2 since there are two trapezoids, so these 2's cancel out. The top and bottom side add to be 162.3057 inches. Multiplied by the height gives us the total area for the hexagon being 7604.6063 square inches. Now we have to multiply that by 12.3184, which is the depth and thickness of Mario's hexagons, and we have 93,676.8262 cubic inches. Now we need to convert this into milliliters. Since one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters, one cubic inch is equal to 16.3871 cubic centimeters, or 2.54 cubed. Now we multiply this fraction by our previous value so that inches cancel out. Additionally, one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter, and after multiplying everything, just one of Mario's hexagons comes in at 15,350,915 milliliters. Already, we can tell these are some pretty hefty slabs of ice Mario's throwing down. An ice platform that he could easily lay down on, and which is an entire foot thick, but he doesn't throw down just one. Mario can just skate around till his heart's content, or for 20 seconds, and the most slabs I could get out of him before that was 102. Multiplying this by our previous volume gets us 156,579,334.9 milliliters, or a little under half an average swimming pool. Now we need the mass in grams of this gigantic collection of ice plates. The density of ice is 0.934 grams per milliliter, so all we need to do is multiply our huge number by 0.934, and we have our weight, which is 146,245,098.7966 grams of ice, which is equivalent to a little over 160 tons. Now you may be wondering why we're finding the mass of all of Mario's ice hexagons. Well, that's because it fits perfectly into our next formula, which says Q equals mc delta t. In this formula, Q is the energy in joules, m is the mass in grams, delta t is the change in temperature in degrees in Celsius or Kelvin, and c, or sometimes CSP, is specific heat or heat capacity of water in this case in joules per gram kelvin. This formula works for heating up or cooling our whole lot of water and for cooling ice once it's changed, but it requires additional energy to change state from water to ice. The amount of energy is found using Q equals m delta hf, where Q is the energy in joules, m is the mass in grams, and delta hf is the heat of fusion in joules per gram. We'll assume that Mario starts out with some moderately cool 15 degree water and the melting point of water is 0 degrees Celsius, so delta T is 15 degrees Celsius in our first equation. The mass of the ice is 146 million grams, and the specific heat of water is 4.184. Multiplying these together gives us roughly 9 billion joules of energy. After this, we need to freeze it into ice. The mass stays the same here at 146 million grams, but water's heat of fusion is 334. After multiplying these two, we get about 49 billion joules. Next, it will have to go to about negative 20 degrees Celsius to stay as ice, since if it stay at zero degrees, some ice would be melting all the time, and it really would be hard to walk on without slipping and falling everywhere. But we do need a little slickness so that Mario can skate on it and slip just a bit so that he's barely controllable. I figure negative 20 degrees should do it, so delta T for our third equation would be 20 degrees. Mass stays the same, but the specific heat of ice is 2.06, which is very different than water. It also means that ice's temperature is a lot easier to change than water's temperature, 
Multiplying all these gives us about 6 billion joules. Once we add all three of our answers, we will have the amount of joules it takes for Mario to freeze 102 huge icy hexagons, which is 64,049,503,468.959 joules. Now all we need to do is take this amount of joules and plug it into Mario's equation. This time, we only need one equation, since Mario is staying solid and not changing state. So we need the mass, the change in temperature, and the heat capacity of Mario. Over on Game Theory, a highly respected theorist channel, they figured out that Mario's mass is 89.94 kilograms by looking at Mario Sunshine's rocket nozzle and the weight of a go-kart, so I figure that's probably right. Would figure it out myself, but I just want this to be a short, enjoyable video, not an entire documentary. Anyways, this translates to 89,940 grams, which is our mass for the equation. We'll set delta T as X since that's what we want to find out. Now we have the tricky one, the heat capacity of Mario. We'll assume that Mario is a human for simplicity, and the heat capacity of a human was surprisingly easy to find. It's exactly 3.5 joules per gram Kelvin. Divide both sides by 3.5 and 89,940, and we'll get our change in temperature, which is 203,467.402 degrees Celsius. That is quite a few degrees. Now a healthy human temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, assuming that Mario is healthy in the first place. Since these 200,000 degrees make Mario colder, to find his temperature we will need to subtract that from 37, which gives us a final temperature of Mario being negative 203,430.402 degrees Celsius. Now we need to convert this into Kelvin by adding 273.15 degrees, and the number doesn't even budge. Mario goes down to negative 203,157.252 Kelvin. Even if the ice flower was really lame and Mario could make a maximum of one ice hexagon, he would still go to almost negative 1,700 Kelvin. If you're wondering why Kelvin is so important, it's because temperature is another way of saying average kinetic energy, and zero Kelvin is absolute zero. There is no movement whatsoever in any molecules or atoms, of anything that reaches this temperature. It is theoretically impossible to freeze something to or below zero Kelvin, and here Mario makes that temperature appear incredibly warm. However, lately, a group of scientists were able to freeze something below zero Kelvin, and the results were very odd. Interestingly, it had qualities of something hotter than any known positive temperature. The atoms in the gas attracted each other, creating negative pressure, but it didn't collapse. It acted just like dark matter. To learn more about this experiment, Go to sciencedaily.com or just click the link in the description. So basically, Mario touches the ice flower, instantly freezes to death, gets so cold that all of his molecules stop moving completely, then is superheated and feels like he's being boiled to death, but he can't feel anything because he's already dead. He floats around aimlessly as a chunk of dark matter and continues heating up or cooling down until he arrives at 200,000 Kelvin below zero. Then the process reverses, except he doesn't revive himself until he returns to a normal human temperature on about 20 seconds. But my question is, what would Mario need to perform to pass said present perilous pansy? Let's say, just for convenience, that every time Mario freezes to death, he respawns with his current temperature as his new normal healthy temperature. While the lowest recorded by temperature was 56.7 degrees Fahrenheit, and the dude died, we'll be generous and say that Mario is pretty cold resistant, but not that cold resistant, so we'll say he dies at about 59 degrees Fahrenheit, or 15 degrees Celsius. This means that every 22 degrees, Mario freezes to death. So if we divide our last delta t by 22, we find that Mario dies 9,248 times immediately after touching the flower. But we're not done yet. If Mario's temperature eventually reaches the normal human temperature, the Mario alive right after the freezing is complete would be just chillin' at negative 200,000 Kelvin. In the journey back to a healthy temperature, Mario would burn to death several more times on the way up. If we use the same process as before, we will find that Mario burns to death another 19,904 times. This means that in order to survive the ice flower, or the death flower, Mario would need to have a supply of 29,152 one-ups. So, if Bowser really wanted to kill off Mario, all he really has to do is put a bunch of ice flower everywhere and he wins. But how long would it take to acquire this many one-ups? Well, there is an infinite one-up trick in Super Mario Galaxy 2, which gives Mario a 1-up about every 0.74 seconds following the first 7 jumps. This means that in order to get enough 1-ups, you would need to do this trick for about 6 hours. But this is cheating, since it's in the whole other game, so we'll have to use a 1-up trick in Galaxy 1, which takes much more time. You have to go out of the kitchen, run around, collect the 1-up, run back to the kitchen, enter, wash your hands to abide by food safety protocol, exit, and repeat. The best time I got for this trick was 25.6 seconds to the kitchen and back, which is basically what it'll take between every 1-up. If you did this trick, you would need to do it for 8.638 days, a little over a week, 
just collecting one-ups and doing nothing else in order to survive. And you better complete your objective while you have the death flower, or you'll be subject to 8.638 more days of collecting just to try again. That has to be the most stressful skating you've ever done. So overall, next time you see an ice flower, just look over at your petty stash of 99 one-ups and marvel at the overwhelming power of what you're up against. Hey guys, thanks for watching, you should subscribe. Sorry for making you wait like months for that video. I hope you were stashing one-ups while I was gone. You'll need like 175,000 to make it through the game. I was actually planning it out so that time would account for sleep, meals, and breaks, and you'd be done just in time to watch the video. For all you theories fanatics, I am planning on making some changes to the theories. I'll probably get a microphone so that you don't have to listen to the raspy background noise, and I'll be changing the way I present the videos. Watch my other videos too. Gosh, I have three videos now. Subscribe!